interest rate does not tell you anything about money being tight or not. If money is tight, the symptoms of tight money is a stock market that is not at the new all time high. So your biggest indicator for tight liquidity would really be where are asset prices or the, where's the stock market really? Yes. I mean, uh, if money really became tight, I, I tell you from this overbought condition in the market, the market would sell off uh, rapidly. Today, I have Dr. Mark Faber, editor of the Boom, Gloom, and Doom report. How are you, Dr. Faber? Everything is fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your program. Let's get right to it. We have an interest rate issue, for lack of a better word. Not everybody knows, or we don't know exactly what's going to happen. You have a Fed tightening. It looks like the economy is starting to slow down, and you have a lot of global tensions. So. If you could, let's start there. What's going on in the world of finance with money being, seems like being more restricted and yet an economy slowing down on both sides of the Atlantic? Well, I think that central banks can have an influence short term on short term interest rates. They don't control long-term interest rates to the same extent as they can control the Fed fund rate, because what the bond market does is maybe not so much dependent on the Fed's action in increasing and decreasing the Fed fund rate. But we have to, when we look at markets and at economics, always understand that they are long cycles in particular about inflation. So let's say we look at the last uh, roughly 100 years, we have essentially a rising interest rate, a cycle or wave that peaks out in 1981. And after 1981, we have a period of inflation rates coming down. We didn't have deflation, but we have disinflation. In other words, every year the CPI went up, but at the lower and lower rates and interest rates began to fall. They were on the 10 years treasury at 6% in 1970. By 1980, were over 15%. The peak was 15.84% on a monthly basis in September, 1981. And then we went downhill and artificially stimulated by central banks. We also had negative interest rates in Europe, not in the U.S., but zero interest rates in the U.S. And then after May, August 2020, interest rates began to rise. And the Fed fund rate was increased the first time, I think, in March 2022. Late, but nonetheless, at the steep rate, because we went up from essentially zero interest rate on the Fed fund rate to 5% very quickly, five and a quarter percent. So that's the short term. Long term, I think we are. After this, essentially 40 years of declining interest rates after 1981, we are now in for 20 years of rising interest rates and rising inflation rates. Now, the government doesn't have to show you that. They can manipulate the figures, and they do that regularly. I mean, if you ask ordinary people or the typical person in the world, or even rich people, by how much? Has the cost of living gone up in your household compared to, say, 2018? They will all tell you between 20 and 30 percent. That costs are higher today than they were in 2018. None of the costs has gone down. That I can assure you. 
and the inconvenience for people to do business and to travel and so forth has also gone up. So it's not a very happy picture, but for the time being, we have, as, a, as an example, sort of deflation in China because the economy is poor. And we have here, where I live in the north of Thailand, we didn't have much price increases in the last two, three years. Airline tickets are up and some uh, restaurants are more expensive. But say a can of beer, which is the main expenditure in my household <laughs> as, a, as a food, is the same as three years ago. So we have to measure the price increases for each household differently. But in general, prices are up. But I don't think that the Fed will be very aggressive in cutting rates. Because for them, the rate of inflation in the long run is a problem. And if they cut rates tomorrow, say so they lower the Fed fund rate tomorrow, I have my reservation whether the treasury bond would rally. Probably not. The treasury bond would actually like the Fed to increase short-term rates because it will be a sign that they are more concerned about the long-term interest rates and inflation rate than about short-term increase in stock prices. If they cut the rate, what would happen is stocks would rally, I presume, and two, the dollar would weaken. You understand? That brings then another set of problems for the Fed. So short term, I don't think they will increase rates because they must be concerned as well as the Treasury about the commercial real estate market, which in the U.S., is a disaster. I mean, I've cited in a recent report, which I wrote about commercial properties that were sold in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, and they were sold at 50% or more lower prices than they had been sold in 2018 or 2014. Some of the buildings were old. Okay, that there's some depreciation charges that one would have to consider. But it's still unusual to see a property market that is as large as commercial properties in the U.S. decline by that much. Never happened before. So they are concerned about this. And their main concern must be that residential prices would come down significantly because the typical American, he has probably, depending on the household, but the people that have some wealth, say three, five million, they probably have about two to seven million in, in residential property properties, which they occupy. So if that would go down, in price, it would cause significant, significant damage to the financial condition of individuals. So that they want, don't want to destroy at the same time that the commercial properties are destroyed. And then we also have to see the pension funds own a lot of commercial properties and the, uh, and the pension funds, especially the ones run by the government. They are underwater like crazy. They have unfunded liabilities like never before. So the, the Fed, even if they wanted to increase interest rates, I think they would shy away. They're not in a hurry to cut, but in my view, the global economy is in a recession. And also the U.S. is properly measured. You know, if you just say you earn 5% more, but your cost of living is up 7%, then inflation adjusted in real terms, your salary has gone down by 2%.
You know, that really leads me to the point of, okay, so let's say the Fed doesn't cut, but what if, because as far as I know, the, the banks are still in trouble. The, especially the regional banks are still in trouble. So work that out, Premier. Let's game that out. What happens there? Then if the Fed doesn't cut, they're just going to let these banks go belly up. <laughs> uh, no, they can, they can support the banks. They can uh, make liquidity available to failing banks. They can also take them over. So there's a lot of things they can do. I guess they start quantitatively easing again if they haven't already? Well, uh, that's a good question. If they haven't already, in my view, and this is a, a contentious issue in economics, whether by increasing interest rates you actually tighten or not. Because, say, if you look at the country like Turkey or Argentina, they have interest rates of around 100%. But money is not tight. Right. You understand? The yeah. absolute level of interest rates does not tell you anything about money being tight or not. I can say this. If money is tight, the symptoms of tight money is a stock market that is not at the new all-time high. Number two, if money is really tight, the spread between treasuries and junk bonds or triple Bs or triple Cs or high-yield bonds widens significantly. If money is tight, the volatility index shoots up at the present time, it is at an artificially or relatively low level. So that tells me, and uh, if money is tight, you don't get speculative excesses, but we see every day some stocks jumping up 20% or down and so forth. This kind of behavior in markets does not indicate tight liquidity. Got it. So your biggest indicator for tight liquidity would really be where our asset prices are, the, where's the stock market, really? Yes. I mean, uh, if money really became tight, I, I tell you, from this overbought condition in the market, the market would sell off uh, rapidly. But money isn't tight. I see it myself. And I want to explain why money isn't tight. You see, you take my case. I run a business, Mark Faber Limited, is based in Hong Kong, and I have large cash deposits because of the nature of my business, and I need reserves. Now, until two years ago, a pr problem for my business was that I didn't get any interest. You know, the interest were below 1%. So I remember we put on deposit some funds at 0.5% interest. Now I get 5%. So say on $10 million, before I have no income, now I have half a million dollar income a year. Just on the deposit. Yes, just on the deposit. And uh, take me wrong, I don't regard deposits to be very safe. Otherwise, I would have everything in deposits. But I think uh, there is a danger to deposits. And I've seen this danger in other jurisdictions. The last crisis with deposits that was obvious was in Cyprus a few years ago when people lost all their deposits except $100,000.
So I'm reluctant to have all my money on deposits, but otherwise I don't think stocks will have high returns in the next five years or so. I think rather that stocks will continue to drift. In other words, you can have a 10 stocks that go up like the farm related stocks or the magnificent seven and semiconductor stocks. But the rest of the market, and I have a diversified portfolio of stocks in Europe and in Switzerland and in Canada and in Latin America and in Asia principally. But in general, for the last, say, 18 months, my stock portfolio hasn't done well. It's not been a disaster. Don't misunderstand me. Some stocks have gone up. But for every stock that has gone up, another one has gone down. Yep. And would you attribute that to deflation or stagflation, global deflation, or just, yeah, what would you attribute that to? To one and only reason, to the governments who impose more and more regulations on corporations, new laws that puts them at the disadvantaged competitive position and also to some degree of economic stagnation in the world or decline. The demand is simply not very strong. Now, some companies, they manage to cut costs. And what happened is in 2020 and 21, and 22, prices went up a lot. So corporation increased their prices because they had to pay more for oil and had to pay more for wheat and corn and soybeans and so forth. But after 2022, some of these commodity prices began to decline significantly, like soybeans, wheat, corn, cotton and so forth. But the corporations didn't cut their prices. At the time, they kept them high. Uh, apparently, also because then labor costs began to increase. So the corporations, some of them have done reasonably well, also because the corporations are not as stupid as Miss Yellen at the Federal Reserve. When interest <laughs> rates were around zero, they borrowed money for 10 years at next to zero interest rates. The treasury, it's just the government institutions. They don't care about making a profit or not. And they're all incompetent bureaucrats, incompetent bureaucrats. But the socialists always say, oh, the government should do this and the government should do that. Do these incompetent bureaucrats. In other words, in say, instead of saying, I should do this, I should do that. They say, the government should do it for me. But anyway, that's a societal issue. But the point is, the treasurer of big companies, they locked in money at low rates. And also home buyers, the clever home buyers, they locked in mortgages for 10 or 30 years at very low rates. But a lot of people didn't do that, including the U.S. Treasury. So the U.S. Treasury now has to pay more and more interest every year. And that will become a huge expenditure in the, for the Treasury Department. Now they could increase taxation to pay for it. But no, it's easier to pay for it by printing money, which they will continue to do. Yeah, and it seems like what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I would agree with you, is we have, or we are in, in moving forward for the foreseeable future, we're going to have economic stagflation or even deflation, but monetary inflation. And if that is the case, what happens, really what happens to, yeah, where do you put your money? Look, to be a realistic, nobody knows how the world will look like in five years' time. Now, I'm not saying that nobody will get it right, 
because you have a hundred different opinions and one person will win the lottery and will say, well, I saw this exactly and it happened exactly as I predicted and so forth and so on. But in general, we don't know how the future will look like. We, I mean, this development in the Middle East is, in my opinion, worrisome. And then we still have the war in Ukraine, which is not a war between Ukraine and Russia, but it's a war between the U.S. and Russia. That is quite clear. Or NATO. NATO is an agency of the U.S. government, nothing else. Anyway, we don't know that. We don't know how much money the Fed will print. For sure, they don't want to have a major economic problem in 2024 before the election. Because the Fed members, without any exception, they may think that Biden is not the optimal solution, but it is a better solution than Trump. Nobody in America, in the administration, is Trump supportive. <laughs> that should be clear. So the assumption is more likely that the Fed will maybe not increase interest rates more, even if they should. I don't know. But for sure, they're not going to tighten monetary policies and have a stock market crash it's in May, June, or October of this year. They'll, there may be a crash, but they'll print at that time even more money. The so stock should then stabilize. So and if there is a crash, the Democrats will say, well, the crash is occurring because of fear that Mr. Trump will be elected. <laughs> yeah, right. So you brought up the Middle East and your concerns about the Middle East, and we're having global conflict everywhere, uh, Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East, but also China, Taiwan. Yeah, let's game that out. It just seems like... We don't know. Is, we don't you, know. You exactly. Know, the Taiwanese don't want to war. The Hong Kong Chinese don't want to war. The Chinese in the mainland don't want to war. But the U.S. may want to war. We don't know. Nobody in Asia wants to war. They know that it would be a catastrophe for the economy, for the well-being of people. But an outside source like the U.S. clearly organized and financed the demonstrations in Hong Kong is all written down and documented. But the Western media, they are, have become an arm of the government. They don't write about this. Yeah. So we don't know, I guess, but it just seems like the world is increasingly unstable through, I guess, a lot of interventionalism and stuff that we don't know. Yes. Trust, but it's happening Correct. with the U.S. government. <laughs> Correct. You said it. Through interventions by incompetent bureaucrats, the world has become more fragile. Right. Well, is there a specific, and I'm trying to get at, is there a specific area or country jurisdiction that would look attractive to you? Like, for example, you're in Thailand. China seems like if it's, they're having deflation and Asia wants peace, it seems like that would be a buying opportunity in China possibly, or even Hong Kong. Yes, I've been accumulating Hong Kong property stocks, and I tell you what, the Hong Kong property market is going down, okay? But in Hong Kong, unlike Western property companies, we have many uh, property companies that have no debts because the majority shareholder is a family, and during the good years, the family's property holdings threw out such huge profits that they were content not to leverage themselves. And so we have property stocks 
both in Singapore and Hong Kong, that sell at an 80% discount to the book value. Now, I admit that the book value will come down somewhat, but we have to distinguish between an office building in Hong Kong and an office building in the US. In Asia, both Singapore, Hong Kong, and other Asian cities, most people live on small space, okay? And we don't have much social security in Thailand. We have don't, not, don't have any social security at all. But as a result of that, the social safety net is the family. The children, they will uh, have their parents live with them if the parents are old. Or they will live with the parents if the parents had a house or an apartment or whatnot. So the family is all stuck together on small space to go and work in a nice office building in central Hong Kong is a present from God. They want to get out of the house. They don't want to stay the whole day. Imagine stay the whole day with your wife or with your husband. Drive you crazy. So they want to go to the office. Got it. So I guess you would say then that China is a, it's an opportunity and Hong Kong is an opportunity then with with this with the sell off is that would be a place that you are interested in and you would be interested in. Well, the whole Asian markets. Uh, complex. I mean, the whole sector in Asia, if you look at the performance relative to the U.S., since 2011, emerging markets have gone down relative to the S&P. Right. European markets have gone down relative to the S&P. There's only one country in Asia that has done reasonably well in terms of stock market and that is India. But it hasn't done fantastically well over the last three years because the currency has weakened somewhat against the US dollar. Got it. But, the, the, but say in 2022, one of the best performing markets was Turkey. It went up 100%. And last year, the Iraqi stock market went up 90%, and a friend of mine, he has a fund, it went up uh, close to 100%. So occasionally you see that. We bought about a year ago Petrobras, nine months ago in Brazil. It's up 50%. But it's not a prominent stock like NVIDIA and hasn't gone up as much as NVIDIA. But it's done well. So... Latin America is another region I like. I think Argentina is a bit pricey at the moment. So I would wait for a correction. And Milei, he cannot implement the kind of measures that he talked about in a speech at Davos. But he can bring in uh, some improvement. Got Colombia it. is very cheap. Colombian stocks are very cheap. And now in Asia, we have also low valuations in some countries. As I said, Hong Kong and those Singapore valuations are relatively low. And Thailand. Now, you asked me before about governments, you know, which jurisdiction. I'd say there are many jurisdictions that don't, don't function very well. But as a result of that, they leave you in peace. Say, in Thailand... Of course, they also introduced measures against COVID and so forth and lockdowns, but it was relatively peacefully handed, handled. And the provinces, they're run by governors, and the governor, he complies to some extent with what the central government tells him to do. But there's a, a leeway. So some clubs had to close down, but others were open. And there's always a lot of exceptions. <laughs> right, right. 
Let, let me ask you about commodities and two specifics that are coming to my mind is one is oil with all the, everything that's going on in the Middle East. It's almost dumbfounding why oil energy isn't more expensive than what it is right now. So what Correct. are your thoughts on oil? Well, for oil commodities, there is a two trends that kind of are in battles. One is weak global demand that we have to understand in my scenario, where my view is that the global economy is still in recession. Say if you take the peak of economic activity, 2018, 2019, then COVID, everything collapses and then there is a recovery, but we're still below the peak in 2018 in most industries. If I take that and translate it for the demand for raw materials and commodities for copper, zinc, nickel, and so forth, the demand is a bit lower than it was at the time in 2018-19. But at the same time, the cost structure is up. In other words, to produce things has gone up in price. And so the commodity market should strengthen because of inflation and so forth. It hasn't happened yet, but this is uh, something that I need to explain. If you print money and you create with uh, fiscal deficits inflation, the money does not flow evenly into the system. No, it goes here and then it goes there and so forth. So commodities have been weak. But rice is up and cocoa for your chocolate in the morning or in the evening, that is up very strongly. It's actually higher. It's now just beaten the record it was in 1977. That was the previous peak in commodities. So all I want to say is the price increase are very different. We had a relatively benign wage increases until recently. But in my view, wages will have to go up. Otherwise, you get social unrest. And then the oil price, the demand is weak. Okay. We know that because the producers, OPEC and so forth, had to cut production. Under normal circumstances, they wouldn't have to cut production if demand was strong. So the demand side is relatively weak, but at the same time, if I measure, say, everything and adjust it for the consumer price index over the last hundred years or so, oil is relatively at the low level. Agricultural commodities are at the lowest level. Gold is relatively high, you know, because gold was at $35. In 1970, it's now over 2,000. So it's kept up with inflation. Uh, of course, I'm a large holder of gold because for me to store energy is difficult. I could build a tank <laughs> and store it there and so forth. But I'm always afraid of fire and accidents and so forth. So, but, so I hold gold and silver and platinum, physical, not to speculate as an insurance and as a countermeasure against central banks who print money. And maybe I should hold bitcoins, but I'm not a great believer in cryptocurrencies, but I can see the case why someone would hold bitcoins or diamonds or paintings and so forth. I look at the commodity markets, the commercials are traditionally short commodities because they hedge their holdings, their inventory of commodities. They have reduced the short on oil very significantly to a level from which in the last 20 years, oil always went up. Yeah. It may not happen this time. I'm just saying, compared to, say, gold, oil is very cheap. 
Interesting. Well, let's talk about gold. And like you, I'm a pretty large gold holder in my own portfolio physical. My question though, is I also own gold stocks. And another thing that's very confusing to me is why stock prices, gold stock prices have not performed relative to the price of gold. If you would, it's like a, a huge divergence. What are your thoughts on that? And it seems like there's extreme value in both gold and silver stocks. Yes, but I'd like to mention one thing. Most sure. mining companies are very badly run. And a lot of them are run by dishonest people. I'm not saying all of them are run by dishonest people, but quite a few. And it's like in a technology bubble, you have a lot of new issues and these new issues come to the market and you have seven stocks at the end that perform superbly from Google to Meta to Amazon and so forth. And the rest goes to zero. You look at the meme stocks. What happened to the meme stocks, to the right. unicorns? Most right. of them are a disaster including Peloton and this artificially meat. I forgot the name of the company. But anyway, uh, that happens also in the mining sector. You have to be lucky that you have one that performed well. I own, I mean, a relatively large position in Ivanhoe, which has performed well. But the others, I agree with you, is a disaster. Partly, Thanks to our governments, once again, this is an industry governments managed to destroy in combination with the green communists and the NGOs. They increased the cost structure dramatically. And to bring a new mine on stream, uh, say you and I, we decide that the copper price will go up because of environmental issues and so forth, which I don't believe. But uh, assuming we decided we need to build uh, additional supplies of copper from today, the day we start planning to the production is probably 15 years. Yeah. It's a long cycle. I, I won't be around for our common mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. I got it. So I guess, I guess they wrap that up. It's just there is extreme co uh, value, but... There's also a lot of headwinds with governments really around the world and regulations around the world, but also uh, poor management and uh, yeah, but there is extreme. Yes, I, I'd extreme just like to say the final word on this subject. In the 19th century, America had very high growth rates without any inflation at all. Why? Because of the evil robber barons, they build canals and railroads and steel plants and meat packing plants, which lower the cost of goods and tra services, transportation for the consumer. But the socialists nowadays, they always speak badly about the robber barons. Yes, they enrich themselves, but at the same time, Thanks to the robber barons, the per capita real incomes, inflation-adjusted income, shot up between 1870 and 1910. Now, real incomes are going down. That's what I'm saying. We're in a recession. But the individuals, they don't notice. You understand? They get the 5% wage increase and they cr scream, hurrah. They don't understand that the cost of living is going up by 7%, especially if they have children that go to school or if they have children that need insurance premiums and then, and, then. And. No, I'm... I I'm recently, so you know, then, then the government says, oh, there are quality improvements, so we have to make hedonic adjustments. Nonsense! A can of Campbell soup is the same Campbell soup for a for hundred years. In, in any case, if there is a change, it's for the worst that the tomato quality has diminished. 
But anyway, the can of Campbell's soup has gone up dramatically over the last 50 years, especially after 1971, when America went off the gold standard. Yeah. Well, Dr. Faber, I can spend really just hours talking with you, but I want to be very respectful of your time. So thank you so much. I prefer yeah. going drinking, drinking with you than speaking <laughs> economics. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'd love, yeah, right. I'll, play, I'll come over to Thailand, come and see it, and we'll do that. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. go ahead. Good go idea. Ahead yeah, give your contact info, your website, and I'll leave it all in the show notes as well. Uh, the, the, the website is www.gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, gloom, boom, doom. In other words, all in one word. And there, there's information and so forth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not so much- in the promotion business. <laughs> I'll do that and for certainly you. Certainly, I don't promote governments. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I want to thank you for your time and love to talk to you again in the next few months to see where we're at. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, you. good fortune. We have now Chinese New Year, so Kung Hei Fa Choi to your uh, viewers and listeners. Back at you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.